and we are live ladies and gentlemen our viewers in bangladesh and around the world welcome to a very special edition of star books talk um it's a bright sunny day out today uh, and the grass is green and we hope you're home safe and sound today we have a very special show for you we're going to talk about a book but more than that we're also going to talk about a very important sport cricket it's a conversation in cricket uh, about the book the commonwealth of cricket a lifelong love affair with the most subtle and sophisticated game known to humankind and today we have the author a historian and a worldwide cricketing figure he is an author of many books we have dr ramachandra guha and the session will be moderated by our very own columnist uh, professor of economics he is multi talented he is professor astra chotri so may i please bring on our two guests on the screen professor chotri dr ramachandra guha welcome to the daily star book talk thank you um i am thank going you. to let astra chotri uh, do the introduction because i know he has been very interested in doing it so um and i'm going to be the match referee if you will a fly in the wall and just listen to your conversations and if i and i have a few questions from our friends uh, so i will be uh, putting them up to you uh, after a while but for now asar choudhury sir please take it away well thanks akib uh thank you very much everybody and dr guha welcome to bangladesh this is not your first time in bangladesh yeah uh, i think, I I think the... you visited you visited once yeah i was for the day for the dhaka literary festival a few years ago and i had a wonderful time oh i see okay so this is your first uh, virtual uh, visit in bangladesh so welcome and before we start your uh, uh, discussing your book i'd like to start with paulo coelho's uh, alchemist uh, a book that uh, most uh, most young people have read so there's a recurring theme in that book that if something happens once it may ne have never happened the second time but if it happens a second time it will definitely happen a third time so today uh, we have the uh, opportunity to review your, your book and the same day we're here with you talking about your book so two things happened on the same day so a third thing has to happen and that surprisingly and we are very fortunate it's also your birthday today so on behalf of everybody at daily star in and bangladesh happy birthday happy <laughs> birthday you. sir thank you <laughs> so uh before i uh, start uh, talking about the book uh, i'd like to uh, read the introductions so so that our viewers know uh, about dr guha uh, ramachandra guha was born and raised in the himalayan foothills he studied in delhi and kolkata and has lived for many years in bengaluru his many books include a pioneering environmental history the unquiet woods a landmark history of the republic india and after gandhi and an authoritative two volume biography of mahatma gandhi each of which was chosen by the new york times as a notable book of the year having previously taught at yale yale uh, stanford and the indian institute of science he is currently distinguished university professor at priya university Guha has been a professional historian for uh, three decades now. He's been a cricket fanatic for three decades longer still. That means six decades. He says he writes on history for a living and on cricket to live. His awards include the Leopold Hildy Prize of the American Society of Environmental History, the Cricket Society Book of the Year Award for a corner of a foreign field, which we are going to come to at some point. the rk narayan prize and the fukuoka prize he is a recipient of an honorary doctorate in the humanities from yale university where if i'm not mistaken his wife uh, or studied uh, and the interest of the inside the flap is when ramachandra guha began following the game in the early 1960s india was utterly marginal to the world of cricket the country still hadn't won test match overseas but by the time he joined the board of control for cricket in india 50 years later india had become world cricket's sole superpower the commonwealth of cricket is a first person account of this astonishing transformation 
The book traces the entire arc of cricket in India across all levels at which the game is played. School, college, club, state, country. It presents vivid portraits of local heroes, provincial icons, and international stars. Cast as a work of literature, the Commonwealth of Cricket is, uh, is keenly informed by the author's scholarly training, the stories and the sketches narrated against a wider canvas of social and historical change. The book blends memoir, anecdote, reportage, and political critique, providing a rich, insightful, and rivetingly readable account of the greatest of games as played in the country that has most energetically made this sport its own. So that was the introduction to, uh, to your book, uh, according, uh, according to the printed version. So first of all, I'd, uh, I'd like to start with an anecdote. Uh, the editor of Daily, uh, Daily Star Books, uh, Sara, she sent me a, 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 the cover of your book in Messenger. And she said, sir, can you uh, do a review of this? So the moment I saw your name, I pronounced it as Ram Chandra Guho. Uh, because I'm from Bangladesh, we're Bengalis. I said, oh, God, that's nice. So the, the gentleman must be a Bengali. And then I saw the uh, title, The Commonwealth of Cricket. So I was thinking it's a social history. And the subtitle, we'll come to it later, because you have some uh, uh, your branches with the subtitle, uh, a, a lifelong love affair with the most subtle and sophisticated game known to humankind. Later on in chapter uh, page three, I find out that your first name is Subramaniam. So you're from South India. So my question is, sir, before we start, how come your name uh, sounds very Bengali? Well, uh, you know, uh, Guha is a title in Bengal. It's a caste name. But the Guha in my name is a character in the Ramayana. He's the hunter king who takes Ram across the river when Ram is in exile. And in South okay. India, uh, I should actually be G. Ramachandra. Because my father's name is Guha and my name is Ramachandra. And in South India, you normally put your father's name first. But I grew up in North India, so it became a surname. And uh, it's confused many people for many years, not least because I studied in Kolkata. I write a column for the Telegraph in uh, in Kolkata. in Kolkata. And often right. when I criticize Bengalis, I, I accuse them of being a self-hating Bengali. So, <laughs> so and uh, in Kolkata, I was called Guha. My name is Guha. They thought I was Guho. And I Guho, speak we, very we, bad Bangla. Guho, yes. I speak very bad Bangla. So the accounts department thought, hey, to Shaib. Uh, he is purposely speaking in English, so they would not pass my bills. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's the odd way in which I got my name. In retrospect, I wish I had been G. Ramachandra and there would have been no confusion. Oh, great. And um, your book, uh, first of all, I wrote it in uh, the, the today's review that this is an absolute love letter of your uh, uh, of your passion towards cricket and when somebody writes a love letter you really can't critique it criticize it because love letters are supposed to be blind so uh, whatever goods you've written you've been very open about it whatever bads you've seen you've also been open about it we'll, we'll, we'll get on to that and uh, we will see that uh, i wrote it in the review as well that your book is quite partisan towards the, the generational chauvinisms that you grew up grew up with and never, never grew out of. That's a, that, that's a very central theme of your book. So let's start with uh, chapter one, uh, which is uh, a cricket in paradise. You were born in Dehradun, which is now uh, a, a, a separate uh, uh, the capital of uh, Uttarakhand. But when you were born, it was a part of Uttar Pradesh. The landscape that you uh, uh, describe was tailor-made for you to fall in love with either cricket or golf. Because you uh, 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 narrated that your father was uh, in, in the Forest Research Institute and your grandfather, your nana, he was also in the institute. Uh, and uh, 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 how did the landscape of Dehradun uh, influence you to, to cricket? It was utterly beautiful, Asad, when I was growing up. Of course, it's now been filled in and uh, a beautiful uh, lit. Uh, rice fields and leafy orchards have become 
you know, uh, colonies and um, factories. But when I was growing up, it was really utterly gorgeous. I mean, it was one of the most beautiful parts of India. Uh, uh, and with great views of the Himalaya, fabulous bird life. So I grew up uh, actually writing about birds. My first publication was in something called Newsletter for Bird, bird Watchers, brought out from Mumbai by the well-known ornithologist Zafar Fatehali. Uh, and it had large playgrounds. The Foresters Institute had many playgrounds, not just cricket, but it had tennis courts, squash courts. I could play football, hockey, table tennis. So it was really an idyllic childhood. And I had very nurturing parents who encouraged me to play and to read. Even if I didn't do well in studies, they didn't care as long as I was occupied pursuing my passions. And uh, the, your uh, entrance into cricket, apart from the, the lovely fields, uh, you mentioned two characters. The first one, first one is your mama, uh, uh, Durai Swami, uh, who, who, who you, you're calling Durai throughout the whole book. And the second one is your father, who told, uh, started telling you stories uh, about cr uh, cricket. And at some point, I think you mentioned that your father uh, passed the matriculation in 1941. And yeah. then uh, he did well. He, your, your grandparents gave, uh, uh, treated him to go to uh, Bombay, which was uh, at that time. And he was watching a Ranji, Ranji Trophy match where Lala Amarnath was playing. Correct. Yes. And... Uh, so that's your first cricketing hero that you inherited as an inheritance track from your dad. Yeah. So if we start from Lala Omanath, we're basically to, uh, looking at the whole landscape of Indian Test cricket from the beginning. And then you, then, uh, then your mama, who uh, who unfortunately had an accident, and uh, the doctor you you you, you uh, wrote that he uh, I think uh, he uh, 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 the, the plaster was too tight and his uh, right arm wasn't working for the, uh, for, for the rest of his life, but he used to bowl with his left hand. And he was actually your uh, real passion towards cricket. And since you, uh, he had no children, you became his uh, object of desire. And he wanted to make sure that even if you fail in your studies, yeah. you, you, that doesn't matter. <laughs> you have to uh, join, in, join in, uh, you know, play cricket and cricket. Yeah. So can you kindly tell us a little bit about the influence of your uh, father? Uh, but before that, definitely your mama. So, you know, um, my mama, uh, you know, uh, the maternal uncle is a very close relationship everywhere in oh, South, uh, South Asia. I'm oh, sure in Bangladesh too. And my mother was the only sister with five brothers, and they were all devoted to her. Oh, uh, okay. as lucky. She was actually very adored by her five brothers. And this mama had no children. So when he saw his nephew, I was also the eldest nephew. Uh, he saw his nephew with two hands and two legs, able to bowl a leg break and then a googly to his father. He said, I'm going to make this boy a test cricketer because he has two hands and two legs. So I became the object of his ambition. And uh, although I failed to progress beyond playing for my college, I think cricket has taught me a great deal in life. You know, it's taught me the value of discipline, hard work, teamwork, uh, taking failure in your stride. The ability to glory somebody else's success. But if you score a duck, your teammate scores a 50 and you win, you're proud for your whole team. Uh, you know, the joy of playing out in the open, taking a bus to the next town to play a match and chatting and gossiping. So I owe a lot to my mom. Also, the stories he told me about his great hero. So my father's great hero was Lala Amarna, who we saw once play in Bombay in 1941. My uncle's great hero was Vinu Mankad, who was a left arm spinner. Yes, like yes. And uh, uh -huh. he, uh, of course, saw him play towards the end of uh, Mankad's career. But he first heard him on the radio. Now, Asad, you are much younger than me. You told me you were born in 1970, right? So, yeah. still, you are old enough to remember a time when there was no television. And cricket came from the radio. Yes, um, right. Okay. Yes, the shortwave 19, yes. Australian Broadcasting Corporation. He looks much younger, so he doesn't know. He doesn't know. That word he doesn't know. But the kind of when cricket comes to the radio, it excites your imagination. In some ways, it's more exciting, more incredible, more vivid. So, my uncle, in the year 1952, January 1952, India won its first test match against, uh, against England. 
My uncle was in Dehradun. He was 50 years old. He was hearing Minu Mankar take 12 wickets in the match. And every wicket he could describe to me 20 years later, to his debut. Goiga. You know, so I think radio excites a love for the game, a wonder and a curiosity. It makes it uh, exotic. If you see it on television, you see the guy's face, you see how Tendulkar is batting, and it's all there for you, right? So I think I, I feel myself fortunate that my first cricketing memories were stories told to me by my uncle, by my father. And I think that's a, it, a boy, is, you know, his eyes are open, he's listening to his father and uncle telling him, you know, Lala Marnath, he was a batsman, a bowler, and he was even a wicketkeeper. And when somebody got injured, he would play, keep, pick up the gloves. Then he would bowl from the other end. Now, this kind of thing, like, and against the very really is English. So my uncle was born in 1936 when we were still a colony. In 1947, we became independent, and then four years later, we beat the mighty British. So you can understand why Vidu Mankar was such a great hero for him, right? And I think, in that sense, it's the present generation has it easy. They, they have it cheap. You know, it's everyday affair, you know, you're just watching on YouTube, uh, somebody bad, somebody bold, you know, the, the television is always on and you, it's too familiar. It's not, you know, different, it's not exotic, it's not remarkable. And I think I, I, I consider myself very lucky that my first introduction to cricket was to stories told by others and then next listening to the radio you know uh like one of the one of my early cricketing memories is of a match in england in 1971 and it was pakistan versus bangladesh and sadi mohammed the left-hand batsman yes. was batting and he scored a 90 and pakistan lost by about 20 runs and i was listening to this epic chase by a pakistani uh opening batsman younger brother of hanif and it was enthralling, you know. Uh, so I think that's that's the kind of upbringing I had. And my son, I feel, though he loves the game, he's very knowledgeable about the game. We have many arguments about cricket. I have learned a lot from my son about cricket. That's why my book is dedicated to my father and my son. Uh, but still, I feel I I'm happy I was born when I was. So that the first memories, the first stories, my first heroes came to me, not visually, but orally. Yeah, is Dr. Zuha okay? okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Are we not Dr. Dr. Can you hear, can you hear us? Yeah, we're, no, it's all right now. So when you were talking about uh, radio, um, uh, but I also I, I also started my cricketing knowledge for uh, listening to radio, Tony Cozier, and then we you had Richie Beno. Huh. But uh, the commentary of radio is totally different from that of uh, uh, television. Re in radio, they had to uh, uh, picture it in such a way that you you can visualize it. So un unless you were a good commentator uh, or you weren't exposed to good commentators, you wouldn't have enjoyed it furthermore after your father and your mama. Yes, and also because there was so, so little uh, cricket played in those days. I could play more. You know, there was not a match on the television all the time. I was playing with my friends in the street. So in that sense, the absence of television also allowed you to spend more time playing the game yourself. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, for the thing that you fondly remember, about your father is that uh, he was the uh, first person who was telling you stories and also the first person who bought you cricket books. Now, the Commonwealth yeah. of Cricket isn't your first book. Uh, it, it, you, you've written quite a few before that. So uh, my uh, question is, which of the, the, the big authors influenced your, uh, particularly a corner of a foreign field? So, you know, because uh, I... the corner of a foreign field is, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Corner of Foreign Field is uh, considered to be one of the top 10 uh, books on cricket ever written by the Guardian UK. So, you know, I don't Which think books? one particular book, one particular author, obviously, you know, uh, Eddie, the historian of cricket is influenced by C.N.R. James, but I was also influenced by historians who did not write on cricket. So I say somewhere in my book that there was an English cricket writer called A.A. Thompson 
who wrote about English yeah. culture. Right. And I was mm. influenced by him. And my love of Karnataka was uh, partly inspired by his love of Yorkshire. But he was also the great British social historian E. T. Thompson, author of The Making of the English Working Class and other stuff books, who taught me how to locate sport in a social, cultural, political context. And I think, uh, in that sense, there's no one call of a foreign field uh, is a work based on research in the archives. It's focused around the family of Dalit cricketers, the Palwanka brothers. Uh, and clearly, James and E.P. Thompson obviously influenced me at some level. But essentially, it's a narrative history about forgotten figures in Indian cricket before India became a test playing nation. You know, there's a great history to be written about Bangladesh cricket before Bangladesh became a test playing nation. You know, what? how did cricket come to East Bengal? You know, the history of cricket in Kolkata has been written about Mohan Bagan, East Bengal, you know, the Cricket Association of Bengal. Bengal began the Ranji Trophy in 1938 when there were, I think, five Englishmen in the team. But what was happening in Dhaka at that time, in the eastern part of Bengal, before 1947? Then look at the decades of the 50s and the 60s, when East Bengal is part of Pakistan, but is discriminated against. Now, of course, the history of uh, West Pakistan's discrimination against East Pakistan, the political and economic discrimination is well known. And this is the year of the 50th anniversary of independence. So there will be a lot to tell about how East Pakistan was oppressed, subjugated by West Pakistan in economic and political terms. But what about the cricketing history? Is it true, as my Bangladeshi friends claim, that East Pakistan has never got a chance to play for Pakistan? Or was the game undeveloped? Who are the great heroes of East Bengal, East Pakistan cricket in the 50s and 60s? Nia Samwed is one. Nia Samwed is one. Yeah, but now yes, we all know about, you know, Shriko uh, Raman and, uh, you know, and others, right? And, and your Tamim hmm. Iqbal and, and your fine players today. Right, yes. Um, Shakib, but uh, what, like Parvankar Balu, who was a great cricketer before CK Nadu, before Rana Ramana, before Vinu Pankar, there is a young uh, uh, Bangladeshi cricket writer who is in touch with me. Uh, he writes for uh, Cricket Info, Mohammad Israr. And he's working on a book. And I hope this book says oh, a lot good. about the period before 1971 as well. Well, that, that, that'll be great. And uh, uh, the next question I would like to uh, know, uh, know about. In 1970, um, you, you, you uh, marked this as a, a transition year because you started uh, studies at Doon School. And uh, uh, over there, you had a teacher, Vora. Who you got? Uh, you uh, for who was fondly named Bond. He was the next influence in your cricketing uh, uh, experience. And uh, you, uh, another th uh, thing is that uh, in 1970, I, it's not in, in your book. Uh, did you come up? Uh, were you familiar with Amitav Ghosh? Yes, he was. Uh, uh, he was. He was uh, one year senior uh, to be in, in Doon School and in St Stephen's College. So we are old friends, uh, except right. that. Uh, Amitabh Ghosh even then was very interested in literature and scholarship and not much in cricket. So we are friends and of course we have stayed friends ever since. But he was not a sporting type. He was actually a musician. He used to play the violin in the school orchestra. When I was bowling off breaks, he was playing the violin. So he was my contemporary and as I said, I'm proud to be his contemporary and friend. But we never crossed on the sporting list. Right. And uh, in chapter one, uh, there's another uh, incidence. You mentioned Ram Bahadur Chetri, who was the son yeah. of a Chaprasi. Uh, the, the, the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, when you write history, history tends to be, you know, uh, 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 a narration of the victors or the narration of the kings. So you don't know uh, the, the, the big giants overshadow the small giants. So in, 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 cor in corner of for foreign field, you just mentioned his name, Palwankan Babu. In, over here, I, I noticed a similar uh, trend uh, in your uh, description of Ram Bahadur Chetri, who went on to play, play football for uh, in, in Kolkata. Yes, I, I'm glad you noticed him, Asad, because he is in many ways a joint hero with my uncle Dore. And it also shows yes, he was the that, son of Yeah. He was the son of a Chaprasi. My uncle Dore was the son of the top scientist in the institute, but their children were best friends. 
the sport can transcend social barriers uh, in a way in which maybe uh, music can perhaps but certainly not other spheres of life and he was a wonderful human being ram bahadur ramu as i called him and i'm very glad that you uh, noticed how much care and attention i paid in the narrating yes, i noticed it very well and uh, i noticed another thing that uh, years later your mama uh, you went to visit your mama and uh, uh, there, there were three rams in the uh, team ram yeah. bahadur was uh, absent and then uh, since you're a ram your mama uh, substituted you for, for ram bahadur chetri <laughs> so i, I really yes. like that, really like that incident yes and now the 11 chapters i think they were designed uh, for for uh, to represent 11 members of a team that was by design right absolutely the 11 yeah. okay and when i read the uh, when i saw 11 chapters i got a uh, signal okay then uh, the, this must be uh, designed for uh, 11 players of a team and then i uh, read chapter 1 i found 11 sections so i was uh, very curious is chapter 2 going to have 11 sections as well So chapter two had eight sections. So uh, then I thought, no, no. Then that that trend has gone. But in chapter two, uh, which you've did, uh, uh, is an eleven of one's own. You start with the 1971 tour to West Indies. Now my uh, interest in this uh, particular tour was my first cricket book was a history of West Indies cricket by Michael Manley. Yeah, uh, and uh, in that uh, in that. Uh, 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 book. I, I learned about this particular um, test series, and uh, you said that uh, you've written uh, the entire book from me uh, memory, uh, except for the, the chapters uh, of your uh, uh, time in BCCI. But I found one factual error in this uh, uh, 1971 series. In the book, you mentioned there's four tests. There were actually five tests. Yeah, uh, there okay. are actually so, several uh, factual errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were the five tests, and uh, India won uh, the second test at Queens Park, at Trinidad. I have two questions regarding that uh, uh, series, uh, yeah. which I'd like to know from you. Number one, uh, you, uh, when, whatever narrative we read about that uh, particular series, it was a path-breaking time for Indian cricket. The first time they defeat West Indies in West Indies, Sobers was in the team, Conrad Hunt was there, and Rohan Kanhai was there. True that uh, it was a team that was in a decline, but uh, nevertheless India won, and the, that uh, series also saw the rise of young Sunil Gavaskar, 700 runs uh, in, in his debut series, batting without a, a helmet, etc., against fast bowling, and you had Ajit Warikar. But many of the narratives that I re read tend to, uh, uh, like I said, big giants overshadow uh, small giants. They tend to over uh, over uh, overshadow. Dilip Sabdesai's uh, contribution in that entire series, uh, uh, the, yes. and uh, uh, and I and also found out that you are very f f you're friendly with the uh, son of Dilip, uh, Dilip Sabdesai, yeah, uh, Rajdeep Sabdesai. Uh, what what is your take on this? That Sabdesai got uh, you know by bypassed in various narratives of that 1971 series. Well, you know. Um... uh this is not a full fledged history so i couldn't write about everything and you're absolutely you right sir uh, but gavaskar himself has always handsomely acknowledged uh, not just the contribution of sardesai but the moral support and technical advice that sardesai gave him in playing fast bowling and of course cricket unlike tennis is a team sport so you need uh, when you win a match it's not always the case that 11 members perform But one person can't win a match. So another unsung hero of the 71 series was the off-spinner Venkat Raghavan, who got most wickets in the Test team. Uh, another person who must be remembered is Salim Nimod Durani, the, who got Sobers and Lloyd out uh, in that crucial Test. So another person who's totally forgotten is the wicketkeeper Krishna Murthy, because Farooq and Jinnya could not tour, and a rather unknown wicketkeeper from Hyderabad, Krishna Murthy was. selected and he was keeping to very great spin bowlers and keeping to spin is much tougher than keeping to fast bowling so i'm sure unfortunately there were no visuals of that series but i'm sure krishnamurthy must have done admirably 
because you allow Venkat and Prasanna and Bedi to get all those wickets. So in that sense, yes, Gavaskar's performance was extraordinary because it was a debut. A 21-year-old yes. scoring 770 runs in four tests. Right. So it was uh, staggering. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it was a team and also an outstanding captain, Ajit Wadekar. Uh, and Abel Jasima, who was acknowledged to be a very acute cricket brain, would come on as 12th man to advise Wadekar, even when he was not in the 11. So that those stories, I think, need to be told. And Gavaskar's old writings, Sunny Days and Idols, uh, tell those stories. And then, uh, the um, uh, next question I'd like to uh, ask you about the 71 series. India won the series 1 nil. Five tests, so four of them went out as draws. Now, nowadays, uh, a draw, a dirty draw, a dirty draw can save a match, a dirty draw can save a series. If in, uh, West Indies had won, had won just one more test, then it would have been a drawn series and India wouldn't have been able to win the uh, series in West Indies in 1971. My question is, what is your take about the draw? Because I find sometimes draws are much more exciting than a, 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 a result. Absolutely. A dirty you're, draw. You're quite right, sir. There's a romance and an enchantment to a draw, uh, which is not there. And uh, about 20 years ago, Jagmohan Dalmia wanted to abolish the draw from Test cricket. And I wrote a column in the Telegraph saying, you know, it's like this is a crazy idea. I said, you may just bring down the Taj Mahal, you know, if you want to, if you want to abolish the draw. So many of our memories, you know, Michael Atherton batting against Donald and uh, the fast bowlers in South Africa for 13 hours to save a match. You know, Hanif Mohammed batting three days uh, uh, and so on. Hanif Mohammed, so, uh, 337. Uh, there is a kind of extraordinary uh, appeal that the draw has, uh, which uh, I think it makes cricket different because uh, it makes test cricket different from one day cricket because in one day cricket you win. And even if your scores are tried, this is super over. Someone win. The, you know, super think over. Right. the draw is something special to test cricket and we must retain it. I'm going to come to uh, Hanif Muhammad's uh, 337 later on because that uh, innings is just fairy tale. When you, you, we grow up with. Uh, the next question that I'd like to ask you is, is also from chapter 2. You've mentioned that Indian fans identified with state and county sites in England. Because uh, to, today you have uh, the franchises. So the, this generation has go, uh, identified with the, uh, the IPL franchises. And uh, uh, not only within India, but also in the whole Commonwealth countries where India uh, cricket is played. My little observation is, why did Indian fans uh, identify with county cricket? Because in the 50s, 60s and 70s, maybe not up to the 80s, it was Pakistan and West Indies players who were playing the county more compared to India. Why do you think that the Indians uh, identified with county? Why did I? Why did players not play? Indian players not play? Or why did I? And well, I think it's to do with the hangover of colonialism, Asrar. That you know we was uh, still okay. a post-colonial society, and things about England appealed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Beatles, for example, or or the novels of British writers, Lords. or reading the Times, Lords. So I think we followed county cricket. In fact, I'm glad that we don't follow county cricket anymore. I'm not so happy about IPL. That's a quite different story, but. When I was young, every newspaper would carry the county scores. It was ridiculous. You know, uh, why did they have to carry the county scores? Because it was a, a post-colonial hangover that we followed county cricket so seriously. Okay. Now, that that, that makes sense of, of the hangover. And uh, Thompson uh, mentioned that you made, uh, when Yorkshire is strong, then England is strong. You made A.A. Uh, a. Thompson? Uh, he made yeah. this uh, a, a, a comment. When Yorkshire is strong, England is strong. The reason why I'm asking this is in the context of uh, Indian cricket, when Bom Bombay, uh, literally Bombay was the uh, uh, center of uh, Indian cricket. After partition and also before partition. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If my memory serves right, the first All India team that went to uh, England to play, half of the team was uh, from... Karachi, half of the team was from Bombay. But you, uh, your state, Karnataka. Well, 
and Bombay has over the years produced wonderful players. Oh, anything wrong? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear us? I can hear. Go ahead. Oh, okay, you're hearing. Uh, my uh, my question was uh, in seventy four March seventy four in the Ranji Trophy, uh, the Karnataka defeats Bombay in the uh, semi final, and you were present there. This was a turning point in Indian uh, cricket history, uh, not the international one, but but your domestic first league. Can you kindly mention why it was a turning point? Because till that stage, Bombay was regarded as invincible. Uh, when we won in uh, England and West Indies in 1971, more than half the team was from Bombay, from one city. And they had won at that stage in 1974 when I watched this match. The Ranji Trophy for 16 years in a row. I was born in 1958 and all my life, uh, till this moment, March 1974, the Congress party had ruled India and Bombay had ruled India. Great. I was witness to a dethroning of Bombay. Three years later, I was also witness in Delhi to the dethroning of the Congress party by the Tata party. It is also an epical event in Indian history because one party domination is bad. You know, it will be disastrous if the BJP rules India forever or if the Awami League rules Bangladesh forever or one team wins all the time. So I think. Karnataka's vanquishing of Bombay gave hope to other teams like Tamil Nadu, Hyderabad, Bengal, and so on and so forth, Punjab, Delhi, to also get their act together. And today, the Indian team is truly uh, non parochial. Of the 11 players, so uh, the 11 players may represent nine different states, sometimes even 11 different states, in 11 different Ranji Trophy teams. So I don't know what the situation is in, in, in Bangladesh. I'm sure Dhaka dominates a great deal, but how many cricketers are unknown and unsung and don't get opportunities who are from Rajshahi or, or Chittagong or Jessore or, you know, or Khulna or our smaller towns? So I think. Uh, it's very important to have this diversity. And I think Karnataka's defeat of Bombay inspired cricketers all over India to take to the game. Right. Uh, on chapter three, eavesdropping on greatness, you start your discussion, um, your time at St. Stephen's. Um, my interest, because uh, for, for Bangladeshis, Orun Lal was your captain in the yes. team. And uh, after reading your book, uh, after so many years, I, I've been corrected. All my life, I knew that he was a Bengali, but he's not a Bengali. No. Lal. <laughs> no. in La, uh, the Lal surname we have in ba Bangladesh, yes. and maybe Orun becomes Arun. Yes. Uh, 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 but uh, the, uh, from your book, I've, uh, uh, for me, it was not a shock. It was a pleasant surprise that Orun Lal wasn't a Bengali. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention one uh, incident with Orun Lal. Uh, one of my students uh, uh, reminded me yes last night. Uh, yeah. Bangladesh and Zimbabwe were playing an or, or one day uh, tournament, and ah. Bangladesh won. And the man of the ah. match was Mohammad Rofiq. Ah. And Mohammad Rofiq is our first uh, first player who got hundred Test wickets. Yeah. So Mohammad Rofiq, the poor man, can't uh, talk uh, English, and he was very shy to come and uh, you know to, uh, to talk to the uh, press after the uh, 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 man of the match decoration. Then Oruna. Was said in Bangla, hey, chale, tumi edhi and, 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 and he started talking with him in Bangla, and uh, uh, then Rofiq felt very comfortable. And uh, Rofiq, uh, the, 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 so, and Orunal, we've, uh, we know Orunal as not only as a player, but also as a good, very good commentator. Can you tell us something about Orunal yes. that you didn't mention in the book? Something so that you, you know, didn't uh, mention, but you would like to me. So, you know, uh, uh, he, he was two years senior to me in St. Stephen's College. He was my captain. And he was also my first slip. And off spinner always did a good first slip to catch, catch, catch the edges. And he's a wonderful okay. man. Of course, okay. great courage. He's battled successfully with cancer. Also, a very generous human being. You know, um, I, um, I uh, uh, went to Kolkata a few years ago with my son and Arun gave us lunch and he was so caring and understanding about my son. Arun has no children of his own but he's adopted many kids like Rafiq. 
Arun has many chalets. He has many boys who are like children to him. And one of them, which I don't tell in the book, it's a true story. Arun yes, had yes. a hiding man, a dhobi, Istriwala, Istriwala, you know, outside his house. And he used to come and take the clothes and iron. One day he found Istriwala's son studying under a lamppost. And he said, what are you doing? He said, sir, I'm studying for my exam. He said, no, come in. The light is bad here coming into my house. Then he asked him about his fees. He paid his fees. The boy got into individual management in Kolkata. Then got a job in a multinational company. And then uh, gifted his mentor Arulala a car because he had made it because of Arulala. So Arulal had many chalets, many children who were incredibly generous. You know, when I, I went with my son Kolkata and we had lunch. Arun was more interested in my son than me. We were old friends and he was more encouraging and nurturing of my son. He's a very, very special human being, you know, and I think uh, Bengal, including Bangladesh, all of Bengal is very lucky to have him as your adopted son, as your Jamai Babu. You know, he became your Jamai Babu because he married so well. <laughs> and you're very lucky to have him. <laughs> no, we, 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 have, we love Arun Lal. I mean, I mean, we we'd all be anonymous about it. Uh, in that chapter three, uh, you also mentioned that uh, the first series that you remember very clearly in 1966, when West Indies defeated uh, England in England, three uh, one. So uh, the reason why I'm asking this is, uh, did you know that uh, 1966 was the first time that England won the World Cup, the football World Cup? And uh, in the Lord's match, uh, Muhammad Ali came and he uh, took photos with Sobers. I see. I didn't know that. This is first time. Yeah, uh, because when I was reading that, I, 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 I recall that I remember Muhammad Ali coming uh, and uh, he took uh, photos with Sobers and then he took a bat and uh, he, he was uh, trying to uh, play and he took uh, photos with that. Th that one uh, I just clearly remembered. And then you mentioned uh, uh, Jack Fingleton's Masters of Cricket. And uh, I, 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 I want to finish with Jack Fingleton later on. But you talked about Rukmini Mukherjee, who was the daughter of Sujit Mukherjee. She, uh, you, you became friends with her. And later on, you talked with uh, Sujit Mukherjee. Uh, can, can you tell, me, tell us something about that meeting that you had with Sujit Mukherjee? Thanks to your friend, uh, his daughter, uh, Rukmini. Rukmini, sorry. Yeah. Anything wrong? No. no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You want me to talk about it, or you have a question? Yeah. 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 The question was: uh, um, You met Sujit Mukherjee, uh, one one of the leading. Uh, Writers in Indian cricket through through his friend uh, daughter Rukmini can you tell us about something about that uh, uh, meeting. So you know again you know uh, I met him first in the World Book Fair and we told and we went and watched a Rajiv Trophy match and G R Vishwanath got a hundred and G R Vishwanath was a great hero of mine because he was from my home state Karnataka he was the first Test cricketer I shook hands with first and he was getting a hundred check check answer. yeah and in this hundred. I was talking with Sudhir Mukherjee about his memories. So he was telling me about hmm. playing against CK Naidu, about watching Azare bat. So it was one of my most memorable afternoons. I can still think of it in the Ferocia Kotla, which is now a very ugly, uh, dreadful stadium, extremely unattractive place to play and watch cricket. In those days, it was open. It was never like a Chamiana. And you would sit in you know, uh, chairs or more or less on the grass. And here was this match unfolding. With G.R. Vishwanath playing glorious off drives and on drives, and Sujit Mukherjee telling me stories. You know, he was smoking a pipe. In those days, you could still smoke in a cricket stadium. It wasn't banned. And this older person, a well looking writer, was telling me his memories. So, just as Dore, my uncle, when I was a little boy, would talk about his memories, later on, as a college student, it was Sujit Mukherjee who would tell me his memories. And he, unlike my uncle, Sujit Mukherjee was a Ranji Trophy player, he played for Bihar. And he was also a very okay. well read in cricket literature. So he introduced me to cricket writers as well. So I have very happy memories of my conversation with Mukherjee about cricket and usually while watching a Ranji Trophy match. 
Okay, I uh, I'd like to go uh, now to chapter five, handshakes with heroes. You've talked about quite a few people here: Tiger Patodi, Abbas Ali Beg, Hunuman Singh, who, who, who you mentioned a little while ago as well, and Venkat Raghavan, Kapil Dev, Azharuddin. But I'd like to uh, not to remind you for our readers that Hunuman Singh was uh, special for you because of your mama, because Hunuman Singh uh, gave your mama something which later on you inherited as an inheritance track. C can you kindly tell, the, the, tell our uh, uh, listeners about that? Your mom, uh, Hunuman Singh yes. presented so something Singh, to your mama? Yeah, so Hanuman Singh uh, played inter-college cricket with my mama. Uh, he played for law college right. and my mama played for St. Stephen's and they were good friends. And because my uncle played high quality cricket with one hand, Hanuman had great affection for him. So when he left the university, he gifted him a special pair of cream trousers, flannel trousers to play in. And those came to me. So I would use them for inter-college inter matches. Of course, later on, Hanuman played for India. He got 100 in his first test match against England in 1964. A very gentle, civilized, friendly man. And when I met him many, many years later, by which time I was already 40 years old, he was still a boyhood hero for me because he was my uncle's friend and comrade whose trousers I had inherited from my uncle. Cricketing trousers, <laughs> not ordinary trousers, cricketing trousers. And do you still have those uh, cricketing trousers? Sadly, no. Sadly, no. I wish I did, but I don't. Oh, no. <laughs> it would have been nice if you did. Uh, uh, now I'm going to come to chapter six regarding the sightings of Sachin. This is a uh, this is the only player who demands an entire chapter in your book for obvious reasons. He he's one of the greatest cricketers of uh, in Indian history. But also, don't you think uh, Sachin stood uh, was playing at a very crucial uh, transition point in India's history? Not only as a cricket a rising cricketing power, but also because the Indian society at that time was starting to boom, and then uh, and then uh, then slowly cricket started to, like I said, big uh, big giants overshadowed small giants. Cricket started to become the sport in India. Would you agree with that uh, during the Sachin era? With that you've did, yes. uh, it started uh, a little earlier because we won the World Cup in '83, and that's probably the beginning yeah. of cricket becoming more important than hockey and football. But the supremacy of cricket was consolidated in Sachin's time. Sachin himself, by his batsmanship, uh, by his taming all the great West Indian and South African fast bowlers, was inspirational. The 90s were a very difficult decade for India with religious conflict, caste conflict, uh, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, economic inequalities. So Sachin was the glue, he was the solidifying factor. And uh, as I say, I also had a personal relationship with him. Because I published my first book in 1989 and he made his test debut in 1989. Yes, so my career that, yes. him, you know, and was ran parallel with him for two decades. So I have a special affection for Sachin for that reason. That there's a personal connection. Though I have never met him. Okay. And actually I don't want to meet him. Because I'd rather watch it back. I don't think it'll be a good conversationist, you know. <laughs> Unlike Tiger Patauti or Gary Stubbers or Rahul Dravid or Anil Kumle. I wouldn't want to spend time with Sachin uh, talking. You know, I'd rather watch videos, old videos of his batting. <laughs> uh, so in the next chapter, in chapter seven, Hindu pantheon, because uh, uh, here you, uh, this is a, a mixture of uh, cricketers from different countries. The one that I'd like to start with is, uh, uh, where is it? No, yes. Uh, in, in this chapter, you mentioned you used to discuss about Bangladesh, and you were talking about the uh, test that you uh, listened to on radio in Dhaka. It was uh, Pakistan versus England in 1969, and then you uh, mentioned about Niaz Ahmed, the local boy. Uh, to, to, to my best knowledge, Niaz Ahmed actually his family came from uh, Banaras after partition, and they settled in uh, what was then East Pakistan. So he was the local boy. I was, uh, I mean, I didn't, I, I myself didn't know about this incident that uh, uh, you, uh, that you mentioned. And uh, also you, in, over there, you uh, narrated the, uh, the inequalities uh, the, 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 that the people of Bangladesh, uh, or, or then Bangladesh, uh, faced uh, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the hands of the West Pakistanis 
this uh, inequality was not only uh, economical, but it was also uh, sh 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 shown in sport. And uh, then you go on to talking about the 1999 World Cup defeat of Pakistan. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was at, in the UK at that time, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't watch it on television. I had to w w follow it through radio. Then you talk about the Bangladesh test at Lords in 2005. I was really surprised that you went to Lords and watched day one. And you fondly talk about Mushfiqur Rahim. The reason why I'm mentioning Mushfiqur Rahim is uh, he's the only, uh, he's our uh, most successful test player in, in the sense he scored, he scored three double centuries already in tests. And uh, the way you uh, picked him out and Niaz Ahmed, uh, that this was done through a historian's eye. Uh, yeah, that, that, so, that's my take know, on it. I have vivid memories of watching. Yeah. That, that, that uh, thing and... Uh, and then you go on to go talk about a uh, uh, World Cup uh, 2007 when India is knocked out by Bangladesh. And uh, in the Hindu pantheon, uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, two people. Number one, Hanif Muhammad. When I started following cricket, I mean, Hanif was, uh, Hanif sir was more larger than life. And that, uh, you, you, you know, that uh, triple century in, in uh, Barbados, where he actually saved the match 970 minutes uh, it was his 337 and uh, you mentioned another inter uh, it's not in the book but please correct me if i'm wrong when in 1981 when india went to pakistan to play uh, a series did gavaskar just get out of the airport and go and meet hanif sab yes that was in 1978 in karachi he went oh, straight from the airport he said i want to meet the original little master that's true that's true yeah and another anecdote that you mentioned in there, uh, the reader, uh, the listeners might enjoy it. Uh, when uh, Hanif Saab was playing in uh, Adelaide in the 1960s, and he broke uh, uh, one of Don Bradman's record. Uh, I, I know what happened. Can you tell tell the, uh, our listeners what happened? After breaking, uh, uh, Hanif Saab scored 452, and then uh, Don Bradman came uh, to the uh, Pakistan dressing room. I, I know I know what happened, but uh, if you tell the uh, listeners, yeah. So you know, Don Bradman uh, had the world record, for the highest first class score, five four fifty two. Ali broke it in a uh, first class match in Pakistan, and he was run out going for the five hundred run. Um, and then from then on, next year, they, yeah, Pakistan toured uh, Australia, and the Don Bradman went to the dressing room. And he saw Hari, who's a tiny fellow. And he said, you're the man who broke my record. I thought the person would be at least six feet. And Hari said, sir, you will always be the greatest. He was so embarrassed. <laughs> Hari was a very, uh, sir, Hari was a very kind of shy, gentle person. And not at all a kind of boastful, uh, you know, a sportsman of the kind you find nowadays. The reason why I'm, uh, I, I, I asked you this question is that when... Uh, Inzamam scored a triple century against New Zealand, and uh, he couldn't uh, he, uh, did um, or surpass Hanif Sab's 337. I think he got 310 odd. Uh, and uh, after he, uh, after the match, he just said that even if I went on to uh, surpass Hanif's record, Hanif would, uh, I wouldn't have been able to uh, surpass the legend that he was. Yeah. And. Another reason why I'm asking you uh, is that uh, you talk about Javed Miandat, another person from Karachi, uh, yeah, like Hanu Saab. Uh, I wrote it in the, today's review, and I really liked it when you mentioned about that quarterfinal between India and Bangalore, because the narrative that we see in all the videos uh, that Venkatesh and Amish Sohail, they have a duel, and uh, Amish Sohail goes and tells Venkatesh Prasad to go and fetch the ball from the boundary. And the next ball... Uh, uh, Prasad uh, sends his wickets off. That's the narrative that we see. But that surprisingly and unfortunately was Miyanda's last match and he ran, uh, was run out for 38. Can you kindly tell us, uh, our viewers, what your reaction was in the stadium because you were there watching the match? Yes, yeah, so uh, Javed was run out. Javed uh, was uh, it was the last chance of Pakistan to win the match. And when he was run out, we knew that 
we, uh, we would win. And he walked back to the stadium and I had mixed feelings. Of course, I knew that India was going to win. But I also knew this is the last time I'd see a great international player. So as he walked off towards the pavilion, and I was the pavilion, I stood up to clap. Uh, and, and as I, the, there was a silence, no one was clapping except me. Because the whole crowd was so jingoistic. And although I may have wanted my side to win, I, as a cricket fan, I wanted to give a proper salute to this great player who had ended his career, fighting bravely. So I stood up to clap, and nobody clapped. And one guy said, why the hell are you clapping for this master? And I said, you should clap too. And he said, I never want to see him again. So, you know, this is a kind of um, hatred and animosity that sport can produce. Which is why, as you know, in my book, I have an epigraph from Jack Fingleton saying, I'm not an Ashton. I bought a good match. No longer do I want India to win all the time. You know, and I think that incident left a profound impression on me. But I was the only person in the pavilion uh, saluting Javed Miandad for having not just played such a fighting innings that day, but for having been such a great player for so long. That's why uh, I, I, I was really touched by that. Because that's, uh, in fact, um, the uh, uh, relationship between the players, no matter what uh, jingoism or, you know, warfare the fa fans make out, the, the relationship is always mutual respect. For, for example, a few days ago, Babar Azum, yeah. Uh, he became the number one OD player and he ended Vidat Kohli's 41-month uh, 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 reign at the top. And uh, Babur Azam was saying in an interview that uh, he remembered something that Vidat taught, told him at one time, that when you're batting uh, in the nets, play as you're, you're playing on, uh, in a match. Because if you're not serious in the nets, you'll definitely make a mistake in the match. And, uh, and Babur just, you know, he fondly just uh, uh, recalled it. Uh, 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 that, that this is something I learned from Virat Kohli. And a little while ago, you, you mentioned in the 78 series, Sunny Gavaskar just lands in Karachi and he has to go and visit uh, Hanif Saab. So the, uh, the mutual love and respect between the uh, players is there. But uh, uh, as you said, you, you were the only person in the stadium who uh, uh, saluted Javid Miandad. This jingoism uh, is very unfortunate. Yes, absolutely. Which takes, us, which takes us to the next two chapters, uh, your, uh, or your stint in the BCCI, Chapters 9, Accidental Administrator, and Chapter 10, uh, Exiting the Establishment. But I think at this point, Akib might want to ask you a question from one of our, uh, one of, uh, one of our viewers. Who, who made a pre uh, question before the uh, today's show? I do, I do. Thank you, Asar sir. And finally, from the non-strikers end, I must say I have a few questions uh, right. from one of my <laughs> some of my friends and colleagues, of course. Um, so now that we are in chapter nine, titled accidental administrator, one of my friends, uh, Ragi Brakesh, who is the national president of ISEC in Bangladesh, a youth organization, uh, he has a question for you, sir. How do you view IPL before and after the Lodha committee? Um, wasn't the IPL producing top-notch cricket players even before the committee's recommendations came into place? You know, I'm a well-known critic of the IPL. And I think it's a wild exaggeration that it produces top-notch cricketers. The best cricketer still comes with the Ranji Trophy. There's the odd player like Bumrah who's made a great impact through the IPL and not so much through the Ranji Trophy. I'm sure 2020 cricket hones your skills. I should clarify. I'm not opposed to 2020 cricket. I find IPL vulgar. It's full of cronyism and corruption. Right now, we are going through an awful pandemic. Thousands of Indians are dying. Families are bereaved. And these jokers are playing away. They have the best medical attention where other people can't get doctors. They can't get oxygen. And not a single Indian player except for Ashwin has said anything. It's despicable. If Virat Kohli could have the grace to advise Baba Razam, why doesn't he uh, say a little bit about the suffering of his cities, fellow citizens of Delhi, to whom he owes everything? You know, it's an absolutely corrupt organization, the board today, and the IPL is an example of it. The IPL is going on now because Amit Shah, Home Minister, and uh, Jay Shah runs the board and it, nothing should be stopped. But it is a disgrace. It always tanked. The morality of the IPL always tanked. I'm a 
human being before I'm a cricket fan. For me, humanity before above cricket. In that sense, I think what's happening today shows clearly the worst of the IPL, which I had warned about long ago before the IPL started. I said it will be cronyism, vulgarity, consumerism, corruption, and it is all of the above. If you want a 2020 tournament, play to the Sanjay Trophy team or have a South Asian tournament. You know, you have a Dhaka team, a Lahore team, a Colombo team, a Mumbai team. You know, like you have a uh, 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 you know, European Cup. Right. So the IPL, I mean, I, I, have, I cannot tell you how distasteful I find. I have always thought the IPL, particularly today, we are going through our worst nights in partition. But they still want to play the match. They still want to play the Nagasha. They still want access to the best hospitals, the best doctors, the best ambulances, and people are dying because they don't have access to medicines and oxygen. What are we talking about? Wake up. And I was very happy when one newspaper in Madras, the New Indian Express said, we will not cover the IPL. Yes. I have we never watched the IPL Express. and I've never been happier at not watching the IPL when I see what's happening today. When we are going through such enormous suffering, and these jokers are still playing and celebrating. And Jay Shah and Amit Shah have blood on their hands. Virat Kohli does not have blood on his hands, but he's been re revealed as someone with a heart of stone. And all the other cricketers as well. So this is absolutely the worst time to be praising for the IPL. Praising the IPL for any fan of the IPL. And uh, while we were talking about IPL and T20 cricket format as it is, uh, a follow-up question from the same uh, person. According to you, should we have used more of our resources to solidify the public interest in test cricket, which is a fundamental form of cricket, instead of using our brains uh, in coming up with the shorter and even shorter forms uh, of the game? Well, that is, I don't mind the short. See, I'm an old-fashioned person. I like test cricket. I appreciate that not everyone is a romantic like me, but still, I think this, I mean, the, the IPL is really a circus when people are dying and it's shown it, you know. Encouraged school cricket, college cricket, the IPL is going on, but all other tournaments have been suspended. You know, our school cricket, yes. our cricket, our college cricket, our club cricket, our age group cricket, that's where cricketers are nurtured, right? That's been suspended because of the pandemic, but IPL must go on because Abhit Shah's son is the secretary of the board. That's it. No other reason. It is really awful. You know, it's really, so I think, uh, this, uh, at least I hope that the fans' eyes are open to what an awful, corrupt system uh, 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 the IPL is uh, at a time like this. The worst crisis in Indian history, we became independent and these jokers still want to play and clap and make money and issue the ads. And Saurav Ganguly, the president of the board, wants to endorse stuff on television. What kind of human being is this? Does he have any feeling for people who are dying and suffering and don't have access to oxygen? I mean, so I think I'm glad I didn't want to, you know, be so passionate and, you know, uh, on, uh, uh, when we're talking about my book. But I have to, you know, as I said, this is, uh, it is unspeakable, indefensible that the idea is continuing now and the players are silent. People too bad. We are, except for Ashwin, no one has spoken. And Harbhajan Singh, no one has spoken. They want to just collect their paychecks and allow people to die. That's how they are. Absolutely heartless. I have contempt for every cricketer in the, every Indian cricketer in the IPL. At least two or three Austin cricketers have gone home. Pat Cummins has donated some money. But the Indian cricketers are utterly contemptible. Very contemptible. Akim, do you have more questions regarding this? I do have some more questions, but I think I'll send it back to you now. Uh, I have some questions for you. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, Dr. Guho, I watched 22 matches of the IPL, the, uh, the inaugural match, and that too at the incest, uh, 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 pressure of my wife. And then I watched another match of Kolkata Knight Riders because Shakib was there. My w wife uh, uh, forced me, and then I uh, just told her, look, I don't like franchise sports. It's not, it's not like the beauty of test cricket is you play for chivalry. You know, the knight in shining armor. It just goes, goes, goes to, uh, for, for all the romanticism of it, like you said. Uh, but 
my uh, worry is that recently we are hearing that there may be another IPL, IPL two, uh, every year. And w- uh, the problem with this is that there's so much money involved in it that all the cricketing boards of the world they just have they they they're held at ransom. If the top if their top players are going to uh, go go and play IPL, then what happens? We get uh, uh, deprived of Test cricket and other you know n- national crickets. What's your take about this? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 oh, yeah. You know, I out of the uh, board, I have, and I don't watch IPL. But I know what is happening now in America called cricket clubs? Um, it's such a storm tragedy is being enacted in the hospital, in our streets, in our homes. Probably more than a million Indians have died. You know, the official figure is 200,000. It's closer to a million Indians have died. And we are still playing, watching, writing about comment for IPL. I think it shows how depraved we have become as a culture that we can have IPL at this time. So I think it's best that we, the rest of this discussion, we don't talk about IPL. Because, you know, just, okay. I mean, it's, you're just going to make me more upset and more angry. And, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> I mean, it is a, it is a, it is a disgrace that this is happening the more. Okay, we 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 won't talk about the IPL. Uh, yeah. Akib, do you have any more questions to ask to Dr. Guha? You're on mute. Akib, you're, you're, on mute. Okay. you're on mute. I think. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm back. Okay. So uh, I understand and maybe I can make uh, things more lighter now. So uh, I'd like to share an anecdote. Um, That is my father is my father's favorite cricket player is Brian Lara. Uh, He loves his. So so, so is mine. (laughs) Oh, wonderful. So so I know uh, when I was born, he, he probably wanted to name me Brian, but he didn't, thankfully, because my mother was a big fan of the bowler, Pakistani bowler, Akib Javed. So, uh, <laughs> so if you know now, my name is actually from the Pakistani bowler, uh, Akib Javed, who helped uh, Pakistan okay. win the 1992 Cricket World Cup. So uh, in that note, when we're talking about bowlers, we have a question from uh, Fahmim Ferdos, who is the city desk editor of the Daily Star. Uh, he asks... Uh, if you're asked to choose between the generations of spin bowlers, uh, such as Jim Laker, Tony Long, uh, Richie Beno, Shubhash Gupta of the 50s, and then Abdul Qadir, Derek Underwood, and the Indian spin quartet of the 70s, or even um, Warren Sucklane, Kumble, Murali of the 90s, which would be your favorite, Dr. Guha? I know the answer. So you, want, you want to compare them? No, we want to know about your uh, favorite bowlers. So, you know, I am a partisan of bowling over batting. And my book makes that clear. I mean, yeah. batsmen get too many man of the match awards, which is why I was happy to hear the story about Mohammad Rafiq getting that man of the match award uh, in the Bangladeshi tournament. Uh, I am a partisan of speed bowlers because I'm a speed bowler myself. About speed bowlers, I'm a partisan of the most exciting and difficult art to be a bowler. I became an operating bowler, it was easier. It was my competence. I was not good enough to be a good bowler. So I, I wish I was this kind of bowler. I wish I bought so much of the bowl. Uh, you know, both uh, Gary Sober and Frank Warren said, fast book they gave him then more trouble than any bowler in the street. And there's much more footage of watching him. But I was lucky to watch Vijay Sundekar, Adil Kore, Abdul Kadir, Musta Hammer, all sang of Zimbabwe, very fine underrated bowler, and above all, the cliche bowl. So I think, let's uh, add uh, Stuart McGill, another great favorite of mine, somewhat underrated, to go back to Asalar's point. Uh, he was in the shadow of one. So, uh, incredibly gifted and talented. Like Ramana Heras was and a uh, uh, who? What, Ali? Uh, Rangana Heras was under the shadow of Murali. Murali, that's right. Rangana 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 Rangana. Rangana. So, I think uh, 
that's right. So I think spin bowlers, uh, and particularly uh, leg spin googly bowlers, provide great joy, and uh, because of their art, their variation, their dexterity, and also uh, leg spin googly bowlers bring out the best of the wicketkeeper. You know, uh, uh, I think Kumble was very difficult to keep to. Bodhi was good at everyone except Kumble. But to watch Nair Mongya keep to uh, uh, Kumble or uh, Vaseem Bari keep to Abdul Kadir, was, you know, it's very, uh, for the aesthetic side, for the aesthetic, aesthetic uh, the Jugal Bandi, as we say in Hindustani music, the Jugal Bandi between the wicketkeeper and the leg spin bowler, between Jane Warren and Adam Gilchrist, or between Anil Kumble and um, uh, Nair Mongya, or in my generation, between P.S. Sadashek and Sayyid Kirmani. You know, that's what gives you that kind of beauty. A leg spin bowler wicketkeeper combination is unequal. There's nothing to get to match it. And a good attacking batsman, you know, to watch someone coming down the wicket, to, uh, like Tenbulkan uh, against Warren, uh, with Gilchrist behind the stumps. The joy you get from that battle, nothing else in cricket can give you. Akhil, do you want to? Uh, is there other any uh, other questions? Right. I also uh, had a question for our Bangladeshi uh, audience and our viewers. Uh, I want to know from you, Doctor Guha, what is your favorite memory of Bangladeshi cricket? Hmm. So there I think um, the book. there are three or four in the book, but I tell you one is also in the book. It's about the 2007 World Cup when we were surprisingly defeated by Bangladesh. And of course, watched it on television, it was played in the West Indies. But there was a moment when Mushfiq, who was like 17 or 18, came down the wicket and hit a hundred straight for six. With a clean flow of the below and with such confidence and style, I said, this boy is going to go far. And I was like, he has gone far. So in some way, that, of course, it was on, on television. It was not a match I watched. But that imprinted and I talk about it in my book. Mushfiqur Rahim is also a student from the institution where Astra Chaudhary teaches, right, sir? Yeah, he's from Jangino University, from the Department Inai. of History. Inai. So he, he, you and he uh, have one thing in common. Both of you are historians. <laughs> Mushfiqur Rahim and you. So I think I, he's another... Uh, is, is, is it stuck I, or? I think he's having some technical difficulties. Uh, okay, yeah. Wait. No, he's, Hello? he's, come, he's come back. No right. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir, you're back. Okay. I'm back. Ah, sir, sir, please continue. Uh, you don't have further questions? Uh, no further questions from me. Okay. Dr. Guha. I'd like to ask you a few questions outside the book. Yeah. Uh, I could have mentioned Kumle. I could have mentioned Bishan Singh Bedi. There's only one photo in your entire book. And that is you in the middle. Uh, to the left of the frame, it's Anil Kumle, the most successful uh, test bowler in Indian cricket history. He's taking a selfie. And to the right of the frame is uh, Bishan Singh Bedi. Why is it that you uh, include only one photo in the entire book of 337 pages? Because you know, just, it so happened, uh, I met them both and this photo was taken. The photo was actually taken by Kumle. He is much smarter at using a camera than either Bailey or me. And I, as I said, I'm a partisan of speed bowling. You know, I, I'm generationally in between Anil and Bishan, friends of mine. Uh, so I thought it would be a perfect frontispiece of the book, and the rest is all words, you know, no photos. No, but uh, you have, I think you admire Bishan Singh Bedi uh, for various reasons, and uh, you also mentioned that Tiger Patodi, uh, Munsari Khan Patodi, he spoke very high of Bishan Singh Bedi. So uh, can you tell us something about Bishan Singh Bedi in the book that you didn't uh, uh, write, and also that of uh, Kumle? You well, I did uh, quite a lot in the book about him. Vishen Singh Bedi's moral courage, his strength of character, his incorruptibility. Uh, and uh, today, sadly, he's not well. He's been sick for the last few months. I'm told he's recovering. And I hope and pray for a complete recovery. Because he's one of India's greatest figures 
and the most decent and noble human beings. And I'm proud to be friends. It's been the best privilege of my life to have counted the friendship of Jizikiri, who is a truly extraordinary human being. Uh, he's also very well read, and he has a great love of music, you know, uh, Indian classical music. Uh, something about Anil Kumble, which I don't talk about the book, he said he has a great interest in wildlife, and he's a first class wildlife photographer. And I think it's a very important for young sports people to cultivate an interest outside sport. Don't, even if you're even a great leader, I don't know what I would call his interest. Does he read? Does he listen to music? Does he love art? Does he like architecture? I don't know. But every sports person. Uh, if it's a cultivated interest, and I think what makes Kumle special is his deep interest and love of wildlife and vision ready, reading, literature, uh, spirituality, and music. So he makes you more rounded human being, not just a one track person. I want to get wickets, I want to score runs, I want to get the biggest IPL contract. But you're a boring fellow. I think Betty and Kumle are rounded human beings, not just great cricketers. They know there is life outside the Doctor, uh, Dr. Guha, another question outside your book. This is for, from my personal interest. I was telling uh, Akib that I'm going to ha I have to ask him, the, uh, him this question. You and I have one thing in common. Both of our undergrads are economics. Both of us uh, uh, are economics background. My, uh, uh, you know, inquisition uh, is what made you switch from economics to history? Hello? Hello, okay. can you hear, sir? Can you? Network problem. Hello, can you hear us, sir? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'll talk to you for a bit. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Shall I repeat my question? Please repeat the question. Oh, th that is. Uh, uh, you are an economics student. You did your undergrad in economics, uh, masters, and also your PhD in economics. Yes, yes, my uh, my uh, uh, your background is also economics. I think he my question hear is, you. what made? Yeah. You... Oh, he can't hear me. Sorry. Oh, uh, I can hear you. Okay, uh, sir. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, sir? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Shall okay. Go ahead. My question was. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear? Can you hear? Go ahead, sir. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay, uh, sir, can you hear? Okay, sir. So you want to ask okay, ask sir. a couple of questions, Nikki? Yes. Uh, uh, no. The, I'll go ahead. The uh, last question. Uh, the question was that uh, why made you switch from economics to history? I'm also uh, I also studied economics. Uh, so uh, that's my personal. Uh, Hello, uh, uh, sir. Um, so I I think uh, Dr. Guha cannot uh, hear Dr. Cho Hello, uh, sir. Uh, if you can hear me, Dr. Guha. Can you hear me, Dr. Guha? Hello. I think we're, we're hello seeing hey, hello yeah we can hear you we can hear you sir can you hear us yeah yeah you can hear I think us Asar has gone off no no i'm i'm here so, yeah go ahead Kas Ka uh, akib you want to ask a, a question i can ask you sir uh as sir, sir was asking, uh, you both are students of economics, and then you yeah. shifted to history. So he wants to know uh, what yeah. made you shift from economics to history. Well, very simple. I was a lousy student of economics. I was spectacularly unsuited to economics. And I just started, you know, I, as a 16 year old, I didn't know what to study. I registered for a degree in economics. I went on to do an MA to play two more years of college cricket. And then I developed an interest in sociology and history, and that's how I shifted. So it's just that I was disastrous at the subject. 
and I and I was glad to be rid of the subject, and the subject was gladder to be rid of me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, and uh, now the million dollar question. You've claimed in quite a few uh, places this is your last book on cricket, right? Hello. Okay. Uh, hello, hello. Yes. I, can you hear us? I Dr. think Doctor Gua can hear me, but not uh, Asher sir. No, yeah, you can't hear that's me. That's what it is. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, I think that uh, that is the case here. Uh, Asher sir, if you could, uh, I think I can relay the question on your behalf to Doctor Guha. Okay. My question is, uh, uh, Doctor Guha is saying that this is his last book on cricket. Right. But some of the chapters of the the Commonwealth of Cricket. For example, favorite Pakistani cricketers, he can write a book on that one. Okay. Um, the Hindu's pantheon, he can write a book on that. Right. One. Okay. So, uh, uh, so why should this be the last book on cricket? Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Guha, Asher sir asks uh, that you mentioned this will be your last book about cricket. Yes. But uh, he thinks, uh, according to some of the chapters like the Hindu's pantheon uh, and the Pakistani cricketers, and uh, essentially, it's just the same case uh, for Astra, sir, and me. We don't want this to be your last book on cricket. Uh, so is there any way we can change your mind? He had a teacher named Bond, and the Bond dialogue is never say never. Okay. Right. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Astra. I can see Astra now. You know, uh, okay. it is my last book on cricket because I have nothing to, else to say. I have books on other topics to write about, but what I might do, since you asked the question, Asar and Akib, is you know, for many years I ran a fortnightly cricket column in the Hindu, and maybe I could collect some of those articles as a kind of a, a edit, you know, an anthology of my writing, not a full-fledged book, not an integrated book like Commonwealth of Cricket or column uh, of foreign field. But a kind yeah. of selection of my cricket writings over the years, over the last 30 years, that's possible. But uh, I can't, I, I, I have nothing, I don't have enough in me to write a whole book on cricket. I have enough in me to write three more books on Gandhi, for example, right? Or one book on, one more book on Indian democracy. So I know I have, I will write other kinds of books, but Joe Man, if I may speak in Hindustani, जो क्रिकेट पे जो मैंने कहना था मैंने कह लिया और कुछ नहीं बचा है अजी बांग्ला यू से शेष हो शेष हो समथिंग और और कोई नो और कोई नहीं तो सो अतः व्हाट आई हैव टू से हैव टू से एंड आई वांटेड टू एंड विथ अ मेमोर अबाउट माय लाइफ जर्नी विथ क्रिकेट एंड दैट्स व्हाट आई हैव डन नाउ यू आल्सो डिड अनदर थिंग कैन यू हियर मी डॉक्टर गुहा Okay, you 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 connected three generations. You started the, the love of cricket through your father and your mama. You inherited it from them, and then uh, you uh, kept it uh, very uh, carefully, and you passed it on to your son. So hopefully, we'll uh, if you, this is your last book, uh, uh, we definitely don't want that to happen. Maybe your son will write a book uh, uh, in the next generation. It's quite possible. He's written a novel. Uh, and he's working on his second novel. He's a writer. It's quite possible. He still follows cricket. He knows more than me about many aspects of cricket. And it's, that's possible. But if that's his decision, but not for me. Right. Um, Asar, sir, I think we're almost uh, at the end of our program. Okay. Um, sure. I only have one final question from my end uh, for Dr. Guha. You tied uh, the subtitle of your book. A lifelong love affair uh, with cricket, which you call the most subtle and sophisticated game known to humankind. Now, uh, again, like I said, my father loves cricket, and all my life I've heard him say, "This is the gentleman's game, so you must play the gentleman's game." Um, I guess, as a cricket historian, uh, cricket warrants this uh, answer from you. What does the sport need to reach uh, that? probably that international appeal right now what's wrong with cricket and what recommendations uh, if do you have any recommendations for the sport in itself so uh, my recommendation for the sport would be abolish the ipl it's a poison chalice of course it's not going to be accepted have a international club tournament you know um, 
uh, around the world have a South Asian tournament and then an international tournament. Abolish the IPL. Uh, um, to make cricket popular in Europe, North America, Africa is probably impossible. Um, uh, I think um, then I would say reduce the importance of India. India is the sole superpower, which is bad. America being the sole superpower was bad for global politics. You know, so uh, the bullying that the cricket cricket board does is not good for the game. Uh, and I wish the cricket has had more of a conscience at a time like this. You know, so I think that's where I would say would be my recommendation. Uh, and the young kids don't hero worship your cricketers. You know, they, I, I mean, as I said, I am glad I watched so many innings of Tendulkar live. But I would never want to have lunch or dinner with him. You know, I'd rather have lunch or dinner with a musician or a writer or an artist. That'd be more fun, you know. So don't obsess about the game. Don't obsess about your heroes. All they are good at is a bat and ball and nothing else. As has been shown starkly by what's happening now. So keep cricket in its place. You know, don't make it consume your life. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Guha. Thank you, Astra Chodhri. But before we finish the program, before we wrap up, I must uh, mention... If you are a lover of cricket, if you have watched this sport, if you want to know more through memoirs, read The Commonwealth of Cricket uh, by Dr. Ramachandra Guha. Uh, you can find the it's book. Available at Omnibooks, it's, it is available in Omnibooks. You can find the information on their Facebook page. And Dr. Ramachandra Guha, again, a very happy birthday to you. And we cannot let you go you, without, we, without a parting gift. And... I remember, I just recall you uh, said about your friend Amitav Ghosh, who was into music uh, back when you were studying together. I must mention our professor Asra Chudri is a musician himself. So uh, Asra, Asra Chudri, I know you have a little uh, birthday present ready for uh, Ramachandra Guha sir, which is absolutely unscripted. We did not think of it before this interview. So uh, Asra Chudri, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, because you have to hear me. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of everybody here uh, on the Daily Star, myself and in Bangladesh, uh, we really enjoyed talking with you about your book and your uh, everything. Uh, I'm sure Bhaviji has uh, is uh, has cooked something very nice for you today, and uh, because it's your birthday, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, well, the, well, what I'll do uh, at the request of Akib and uh, Sara. I'll play a tune on the flute because uh, this is a virtual program. Yes. We can't give you flowers. Yes, yes. Okay, so, but uh, I'll play a little tune. Uh, it'll be an S.D. Borman tune, ah, a Bengali yeah. tune. Of course. Uh, Since you uh, spent a lot of time in uh, Maji, West Bengal. Maji. Ye, e, ye, ispar. <laughs> e, ispar. Kudre, Maji, agli bar. You know, of course. Of course, S.D. Borman. Please play. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the the one that I'll do is is called uh, Borne Gonte Chonde Giti Te. Ah. Maybe you've heard it okay. uh, 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 during your time in Kolkata. Ah. And the lyrics was done by uh, uh, his wife, Mira De Borman. Ah. The reason why, Shotsuke Borman was born in Kumilla in Bangladesh. Yes. And Mira, she, she was born in Dhaka. Ah, lovely. So, lovely. Uh, victim of the cruel partition of India. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, nevertheless, the music will always uh, link Unite us. It will unite so, us. Uh, yeah. It definitely. Uh, everybody listens to Lataji. Yes. Okay, then. Uh, I hope I get it right. Uh, talk for a long time. Okay. So this is morning on the Chandigiti. And again, once again, Dr. Guha, thank you very thank much. You. And a happy birthday. Thank you, Asra. Thank you, Akib. Thank you, Sarah.
Sorry, I've talked for such a long time. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, you. Professor Asim Chaudhary and Dr. Ramachandra Guha. Lovely conversation, and we hope uh, you read the review on the Daily Star books. Uh, have a nice day. Take care. Stay safe. Dekha hobe. Dekha hobe. Oh, shay. Oh, shay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.